What's up? What's up? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, so today um, we'll talk about the length and partials thing and how stupid it is. <laughs> and it's funny because it's like all this new stuff keeps coming out in terms of content that people think is going to transform their physique from average Joe to elite bodybuilder or whatever. And I mean, it's just traditional marketing, you know, you're just kind of selling a fantasy, selling hope. They're selling hope, really. Um, and length and partials is a new one. And I'm going to explain to you why length and partials are nonsense. If you're already doing a repetition correctly. Um, now, the way most people train, I think I've answered this before, but the way most people train, length and partials or long length partials, whatever you want to call them, may provide benefit. But that's because the way most people train is awful. The way most people train is low effort, lots of momentum, deloading the muscle throughout the range of motion. Horrible, horrible execution of most exercises. So some of these tricks, if you apply these tricks to exercises that are done extremely poorly, they may help because they may increase effort. When we, again, when we increase effort, when we increase effort, we increase motor unit excitement motor unit involvement. I don't know how many times I have to repeat this. So whenever you look at something new that comes out, take a step back and say to yourself, is this technique just increasing effort? But if you were to compare these techniques, <laughs> To, to a set that is focused on high effort, such as golden era system sets, then they would be less effective by far. You know, these long length partials would be more effective than the way people traditionally do a set or repetition. But if you compare them to a high intensity training set where you're focused on motor unit recruitment, because you're focused on intensity of effort, they wouldn't even be in the same ballpark. So if somebody asked me, what if you add, I think, I think it was up here, what if you add length and partials to training to failure? Nothing, it would have no additional benefit. It may slightly increase the effort on the way to failure, but when you're approaching muscle failure, you are applying the most effort you possibly can into the contraction, thereby exciting the most motor units you possibly can. So the length and partial would just be a more dangerous way of approaching muscle failure. So it wouldn't do anything additional. So and I'm going to demonstrate. Now, in one of the videos, Jeff Nippard, you know, sh showed um, short range versus long range. Sh I think he called them short partials versus long partials. So if I take a, a dumbbell and I do the short range of motion, if you guys have a dumbbell next to you, try it. Okay. This is how most people do repetition, right? So why is that easier? Well, we're avoiding, we're staying in a position where the moment arm, the distance between the load and the axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation is my elbow. This is the load. 
the distance between the two is called the moment arm. The, the greater the distance, the more force or resistance, however, rather, is applied to my biceps. So when I come up here, notice how the distance shortens. Notice how it doesn't feel as difficult. That's why this is relatively easy. Okay. Now, if we go to the lengthen position, go to lengthen position and do some repetitions like this, all right? How does the sensation compare to this? Well, you'll notice this is more difficult. Why? Because we are creating a longer moment arm in a position where the muscle is lengthened. And when the muscle is in a lengthened position, the way the actin and myosin filaments overlap, they do not create as much contact or cross bridging between the actin and myosin filaments. Therefore, when we are lengthened, the muscle cannot produce as much force. So, we are required to put in more effort down here because the muscle is in a weakened position. Therefore, we have to try harder to recruit more motor units to get out of this weak position. Right? So the difference, be the difference between a length and partial only staying in this range of motion versus a full range of motion the way most people do it is this is simply more difficult. And since it's more difficult and requires more effort, your nervous system is going to excite more motor units. It's, it's literally that simple. Now, the way most people do a repetition, this is how most people do curls, right? Pause at the top. In a position of, check this out, the distance between my elbow and the dumbbell is zero. What does that mean? Zero moment arm. What does that mean? No tension on the muscle. That's why people do curls like this. Rest at the top. Rest at the top. So if I'm doing a curl like this, swinging it, rest, swinging it, rest, swing again, rest at the top. I'm reducing the effort tremendously. Now, if I compare that horrible repetition to staying in the lengthened position where I'm not resting at the top or swinging, There's greater effort, therefore more, more motor unit involvement than the previous example, therefore more motor unit stimulated than the previous example, therefore more effective. But the amount of effort you would get by doing this is nowhere near the amount of effort you would get performing a set to muscular failure. Not tolerance failure, not sticking point failure, muscular failure. Which means taking the set to a place, to a point where you can no longer perform the concentric phase of the movement in the prescribed form. Meaning, when you approach failure, you're continuing to contract and it's starting to beat you. That's failure. Failure is not this. One, eight, nine, 
10. That is not fucking failure. But that is still 10,000 times better than a fucking length and partial. Okay? So this length and partial confusion, of course, is started by a bunch of people who have no fucking clue what they're talking about. And, and the thing is, this is, this is so simple. And, and the fact that some of these people have degrees in exercise shows you how low quality the curriculum is. Because how do they not know this? This is, this is like beyond simple. Someone who does know this quite well is Dr. Doug McGuff. He's an absolutely brilliant emergency room physician. He actually understands how the muscles work. Let's see what he has to say about this. Length and partial stuff. It's Doug McGuff with Ultimate Exercise, Body by Science, Dr. McGuff. Can you guys hear this? I'm just making sure. So let me know if you can't. Um, I'm not familiar with how to optimize the sound from a window. Jeff.com. Just a quick thought experiment for you guys. Lots of uh, hubbub out there about the literature that suggests that uh, training in the stretch or lengthened position is better for hypertrophy. Well, the way most people train and the way the form was dictated in these studies, <clears throat> I would suggest that maybe they're having that finding because the way most people train, by the time you've gotten out of the stretched position, bottom one third of a movement, Momentum has taken over to such a degree that the muscular loading is greatly compromised. I think if people were doing better controlled slower repetitions, a minimum of four seconds up and four seconds down, probably a maximum of 10 up, 10 down, then you would not have the muscular unloading that occurs due to momentum. But the way most people training, by the time you've got fired out of the bottom or stretch position of a movement, by the time you've gotten one third way through, so much momentum is involved that you have significant muscular unloading. Maybe this isn't detecting that a specific training modality is better for hypertrophy, but rather that your form is just crap. So for Ultimate Exercise, Body by Science, DrMcGuff.com, you guys go out and do some dope shit in the real world. That's right. Go out in the real world and do some dope shit. Don't sit behind your goddamn computer screen all day. Exactly. So exactly what he's, what what I described. Because the way most people perform a repetition, like this, the muscle is so unloaded from here to here because they use so much momentum to get it up that the muscle's not doing anything from here to here. And then they're resting at the top. And then if you compare that to this, where you are not unloading the muscle because you're staying in the length and position, that continuous muscular loading is what's resulting in more aggressive fatigue, more effort, thereby more motor unit recruitment. It's got nothing to do with the fact that the muscle's being loaded in a length of position. It's got to do with we've eliminated momentum and we've increased effort. It blows my mind that people don't understand this who are trying to teach exercise on YouTube. This is literal malpractice. Like, you, you can't not know what you're talking about and then give people advice that could potentially injure them or waste their time. That's, that's malpractice. So, length and partials. Bullshit. The way most people train? Eh, might work. But, if you do a repetition correctly, and you do a set correctly, like what's in my golden era system, if you want to learn how to do a set correctly to where 
You don't need to bother with this length and partial bullshit. GoldenEraSystem.com. If you learn how to do a repetition correctly, none of this bullshit in the fitness industry even applies. That's the thing. It's like, you know, when we're comparing, when people say, oh, one set, that can't work. Well, <laughs> when you do a set like this, no, one of those isn't going to do shit. That's, that's true. So when people hear about the high intensity training principles, they, they envision what they do and, and if they were to apply the principles to what they do, they're like, well, that can't work. Right, but that's considering what they do is even correct. It's not even close. So don't do length and partials. And another thing is it's, it's relatively dangerous to load a muscle in the stretch position. When you load a muscle in the stretch position, you do create more microtrauma and inflammation in the connective tissue. Without adequate recovery, that could lead to a strain, tear, or just a nagging injury that never leaves you alone. So that's why you wanna stay within, you know, a relatively safe range of motion. More range of motion. Like, you know, an excessive range of motion will increase effort. So if you're doing sets very shitty already, well then yeah, a full range of motion is probably more effective. Just like these studies find. You know, they have, they have 25 people do sets like complete trash and then they find that full range of motion is better. Well, they were doing the set like trash. The full range of motion set was harder. Like it's so whenever you see something, you know, come up in the fitness industry, just take a set back first and ask yourself, is this technique or is this rep scheme or whatever making the exercise require more effort from me? Usually yes, and that's where the value is. And if that particular method or technique is just increasing effort, then there is no need to apply it to reps like golden era system reps, like high intensity training reps, because you're already training with the highest effort possible. Okay, so don't overcomplicate this. This stuff is it's so simple, so simple. Okay, so that's my brief rant. We'll do another like 10 minutes or so of Q&A, but I really just wanted to clear that up because I've been asked it a million times. I know I answered it in live streams previously, but then, you know, Doug did a video on it. And if Doug's doing a video on it, then he must be hearing a lot about it. So then now it really needs to be addressed because... I, Doug doesn't really pay attention to the fitness industry. He's an emergency room physician. He's working all the time. So if, it, if it's, you know, popping up in his world, then boy, it must be popular. Because he's, he's kind of, you know, out of the fitness industry. So, you know, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and submit them. If you haven't tried my uh, training system, goldenerasystem.com. It'll teach you how to focus on effort, how to perform exercises with the highest amount of effort you can safely, efficiently, so that way you're stimulating the best results and not wasting your time or hurting yourself like most people. Um, okay, let's see. Questions. I'll take a few of them. Let's see. <sighs> no questions Okay, I read a study about slowing the velocity intentionally in the concentric phase of a set doesn't contribute to recruiting more motor units based on the force velocity relationship, correct, if you're not taking them to failure. What intentionally slowing the repetition does is increase 
the, the you know make you continuously load the muscle there's there's less deloading of the muscle therefore may increase effort therefore may increase motor unit recruitment um, doesn't contribute to recruiting more motor units based on the force velocity relationship okay I, I don't think a lot of people understand what the force velocity relationship is okay what this means is as velocity increases, force decreases. Okay, I think a lot of people think that if velocity increases, force increases. No, the force will increase initially. Say you're doing a bench press and you move quickly. The force will increase initially to overcome inertia, but then momentum carries the load the rest of the way. The force velocity relationship basically means velocity must decrease in order for motor unit involvement and muscular force to increase. How do we know this? Do your one rep max on an exercise. It's not fast, it's slow. You cannot lift a heavy weight quickly. It's impossible, go try it. If your max bench is 315, you can do it one repetition. It goes up slowly, doesn't it? Because velocity must decrease for force to increase. And the reason is your nervous system needs time to recruit those motor units to produce the force to overcome the resistance. So make sure you understand the force velocity curve before you start trying to talk about it you know you know there's a lot of stuff people force velocity curve whatever and a lot of people just uh, in fitness a lot of people just they just like to say words that they heard without like understanding them um but the, the studies that compared slow velocity to fast velocity repetitions found that fast velocity repetitions increased strength more because the way they were testing the, rep, the the exercise was with one rep max and obviously when you're doing a one rep max you're going to move it as fast as you can you know so the faster velocity or maybe they were doing i'd have to re, i'd have to read this study again but i believe they're using a skill-based one rep max test and if I'm practicing going slowly intentionally it's not going to have the same skill transfer as if I go quickly so most of it was just a skill transfer um, adaptation uh, let's see Duh -duh. Their marks. Okay, let's see. Quick question. All right. If anybody has questions about like the like um, you know the physiology of exercise stuff like that, um, I'm kind of honestly I'm kind of tired of questions about you know I do these exercises is that good? Like just don't ask me that. It's just you go to Golden Era System, download the program. It shows you what to do. <clears throat> um, da -da. All right, moment arm is the distance between the load and the axis of rotation or between the body and the load. Load and the axis of rotation. In this case would be your elbow. So the moment arm is the distance between the load and your elbow. All right, what do you do for arms and arms, legs? Which one is significantly stronger than the other to fix the strength and balance? You just continue to train and they will even out over time. You do not need to do anything specific. Most of my clients in my studios 
you know, if they were untrained, they had a strength imbalance. And I saw within just a matter of weeks, the strength imbalance corrected itself. So you do not need to do anything different. You don't need to do a special exercise. You don't need to train one side more than the other. You just need to continue to train to failure. If you're training to failure, what's going to happen is you're going to fail because the weak side fails first. So the weak side will be adequately stimulated to improve, while the strong side will be stimulated to maintain. And then eventually, it'll kind of equal out. And most of that is neurological anyway. One side weaker than the other is almost entirely neurological. Let's see, why do people send da, da. Jay, do you even need to train traps, abs, lower back, etc., or are those muscle groups being trained like the rear front delts and multi joint exercises? Um, it might be a good idea. Well, it might be a good idea to train your upper traps. Um, they are trained on a lateral raise. So I do lateral raises, um, so I don't you know do upper traps. Um, the lower section of your trap is going to be trained with every pulling movement. Yes, you should train your abdominals. Um, you should train your lower back. So yes, you don't, I don't think you need to train your lower back if you're doing a deadlift or a squat though, because it's going to be adequately trained. All right, Tiago, how would you market yourself as a high intensity training instructor? There's a lot to that. You'd have to join my coaching and, and have me teach you over the course of several weeks how to do that. There is not a quick answer to that, <laughs> unfortunately. What's your opinion of adjusting cadence based on range of motion? Shorter range of motion exercises can use a shorter cadence. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you're not doing a 10-10 cadence with a wrist curl or a grip exercise. So yeah, if it's, you know, if it's a relatively short range of motion, your, your cadence is probably gonna be a little quicker. All right, do you pause a bit after reps doing squats, leg press, or extensions for the quads? I can't tolerate the discomfort when the tension is constant. No, I never, no. Do you mean lock out? Ideally, you do not want to lock out at the top of a squat or leg press. You want to change direction when there's still a pretty good bend in your knee in order to maintain that continuous muscular loading and to kind of save your knees. Um, yeah, you can't tolerate the discomfort with the tension is constant. You know, some people are more sensitive to that discomfort than others. Um, so the best thing to do is just push as hard as you can. You know, or, you know, if the burning sensation with a leg press is too much to tolerate, using a slightly heavier load will, will help with that because it'll decrease the duration of the set decrease the metabolic stress, thereby decreasing the amount of lactic acid produced, make it a little more tolerable. Is muscle memory a thing or just a made up term from the fitness industry? Uh, it's a thing, but it's not, your muscles don't have memory, they don't have brains. It's called neurological adaptations. You know, when you teach your nervous system a particular skill, pretty much learns it forever. So what people refer to as muscle memory is, you know, I haven't worked out for a long time. I go to the bench press and I'm very weak, but then in a couple of weeks I get really, really strong again. And then they call that muscle memory. But what that is, is just turning back on or relearning that skill again that your nervous system kind of already knew. Your nervous system doesn't forget skills. Um, you know, if you don't practice them consistently over time, you become less efficient with them. But once your nervous system kind of learns a skill, it learns it <laughs> kind of forever. Like riding a bike. You know, I mean, you could not ride a bike for 10 years and get on it and ride it again. So that's what muscle memory is. It's just, it's just, it's skill. All right. I know you're not a fan of unilateral exercises. Would you say machines that do have the left and right levers separate are suboptimal over a machine when they're connected? No. 
It's just just because they move independently doesn't mean you need to move them independently. <laughs> so I noticed on like hammer shrink machines, just because they'll go one side at a time, people think they need to do one side at a time. That's fucking stupid. No. Always do both at a time. One in, in if they're fused, if they have fused leverage arms, lever arms, or work arms, or unfused, doesn't matter. Unless it's the lower body. If you're doing a leg press or a leg extension or leg curl, it must be fused. Is it okay to train some days not to failure just to make the body recover faster than if I take a full rest? Why would training make your body recover faster? You know, a lot of people say, well, increase blood flow. It's got nothing to fucking do with it. No. Doing a workout not to failure is not going to help you recover faster. Doing a workout not to failure is still going to, is still going to create inflammation and muscle damage. And it's going to make your recovery slower. Do you notice a significant difference in days where you consume less protein than adequate? A difference in what? No, you're not going to notice any difference. A day you have a little less protein than another day? What kind of difference do you think you're going to notice? Think your muscles are going to shrink in a day? No. No, that works. Does cadence affect your capacity to achieve true muscle failure, fast or slow? Yeah, if you're moving very, very fast... Um, chances are, you know, you're just going to hit the sticking point. Well, no, it doesn't really matter. I mean, because as you approach failure, your repetitions are going to be forced to slow down. So, not really. Okay. Jay, can you say the bench press, if done properly, stimulates optimal growth? It's just bad for your shoulders. Yes, of course it does. It stimulates optimal growth. It's just, it involves a technical skill, which takes time to learn. It's dangerous if you're not doing it with a spotter or in a power rack. And if you go quickly at the bottom, if you kind of bounce out of the bottom, it's going to be bad on your shoulder. But if you keep the repetition cadence slow and change direction slowly, it's not going to be bad on your shoulders. Well, for some people it might, but, you know, there aren't some exercises. Like if I did a chin-up versus a pull-down, one of them is not going to stimulate more muscle growth than the other because they're, they're both addressing the function of the muscle. If they address the function of the muscle, that one doesn't address the function of the muscle better if it's still the same biomechanical movement. I thought muscle memory also meant that certain building blocks of the muscles always stay there so the muscle is able to grow faster again. Yeah, that has to do with satellite cells. Oh, yeah, yeah satellite cells or something. Yeah, there is a theory on that, but I'm not, I'm not sure if it's 100% true. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Could be. Could be this. Yeah, but, I, you know, I don't. It could be the satellite cell thing. Maybe you accumulate satellite cells and they don't really go away. They just lay dormant. And when you start training again, you turn them all back on. Possibly. Not sure, though. If you want to eat protein, would you be able to get to your genetic potential? No. You will not be able to get to your genetic potential with inadequate protein. You will not be able to get to your genetic potential with inadequate anything. <laughs> you can only get to your genetic potential with adequate everything. You can't get to optimal with suboptimal. That doesn't even make any sense. You need optimal to reach optimal.
All right, I've been doing HIIT for like a year, but I don't see my muscles being that much bigger or me being skinnier. Are you training with adequate intensity? Probably not. Do you have the genetic capacity to building a lot of muscle? No. Are you adjusting your diet? No. That's why you're not getting skinnier. So, Charming Fox, you would be a very good candidate for coaching because you're doing likely plenty of things wrong. Jay, is the machine not safer than free weights? As Machines and free weights are equally safe if, if you do the free weights properly. But for the way most people, if they're not taught how to do free weight exercises safely, then if they just go do a machine, it's going to be a safer option. But if, you're, if you learn how to use free weight exercises safely, one is not safer than the other. All right. Is the machine not safer than free weights as time under tension determines muscle growth? Time under tension does not determine muscle growth. Where'd you hear that? No, time under tension has very little to do with muscle growth, actually. Motor unit recruitment determines muscle growth. The more motor units you can recruit, the more motor units you can stimulate, the more motor units can grow, the more your muscles can grow overall. How do we recruit motor units? Effort. It's got nothing to do with time under tension. Is there any truth that you have to vary exercises or sets so the body does not get used to the training and thus grow stronger? No, there's no truth to that. There would be truth to that if you are performing your workouts incorrectly to begin with. If you are doing the same exercises, the same weight, the same reps, every single workout, well then yes, if you change things up, it's going to be a new stress to your body and potentially stimulate a better adaptation. But if your exercise is progressive in nature, meaning I add resistance as I grow stronger, then you never have to change it. There's also that neurological adaptation. When you do a new exercise, there's a neurological adaptation that happens relatively quickly. So your ability to do weight on that new exercise increases very quickly because your nervous system adapts very quickly. People perceive this as an increase in pure muscular strength. And it's usually just a neurological adaptation. That's why they think switching up their exercises is beneficial. Also, when you incorporate a new exercise, a lot of times you get sore and people attribute soreness to the effectiveness of a workout, which are, is almost no relation. Therefore, they think switching up their workouts does something. <sighs> Thoughts on meadow rows for upper back. I have no fucking clue what a meadow, what a meadow row is. Just do a row. <laughs> Stop worrying about the exercise. It's just do a row. Dorian Yates was one of the biggest bodybuilders ever. Did you see him doing any unusual complicated exercises? No. He was doing barbell movements and hammer strength. Okay. When I do hamstring curls, I feel them mostly in the hamstrings in the beginning, but when I'm close to failure, I feel them in my calves. Does they have to do with sensory nerves? No, it has to do with... You, well, yeah, sensory nerves, but you're feeling the tendon which attaches your hamstring to your lower leg. That's what you're feeling. And you're, le and you're feeling that tendon a lot because you're loading the hamstrings in a stretch position, putting a lot of tension on the tendon, which runs from, connects your hamstring to your lower leg, and that's what you're feeling. Because there are sensory nerves there, so your body avoids activities that rip your tendon off. So it goes, ow, this hurts. Don't do that. And you go, okay. So you don't rip your tendon. How important is time under load? Not important. 
If I reach failure in 15 seconds versus 90 seconds, is there any benefit or difference? No. If they're equally intense, no. 15 seconds would require a much heavier load, which can potentially be less safe. 90 seconds may is going to require a moderate load, which may burn more. No, it doesn't. All right, Celion, I answered your question earlier. Stop asking it. Um, L. Darden has a new book out. He's 80 years old. He's recommending 10, 10, 10 protocol. Yeah, it's stupid. I think Ellington Darden just wants to make more money off books. I don't know why he's even doing that. All right, do you think it'll be better, Blood Eagle, if I do the rest pause technique for quad exercises since they're too painful? Yeah, there you go. Try that. Andre, do you feel there is a limit about how many compound exercises one can tolerate in a full body workout? Well, duh. I don't feel as fatigued after isolation exercises if I do after a handful compound exercises. Yes, of course, there's a limit to any exercises anyone can do. Um, simple movements are less stressful on your cardiovascular system, less stressful on your metabolism. When you, when you train a bunch of muscles at once, there's going to be more metabolic stress, more cardiovascular demand. That's why your tolerance goes down. Is it worth getting a PhD in exercise? Um, not unless you are okay with wasting money and wasting time. Because with a PhD in exercise, guess what you're going to be? A personal trainer. You can get a weekend certification to be a personal trainer. A PhD in exercise is outright an outright scam. Will you make free book calls again? Um, no. <laughs> no, guys. I, I don't have time to sit here and you know, chat with people for free. But, you know, we do live Zoom calls in my coaching program. There's a link in the description if you want to join it. So you get to talk to me for nine hours a week. If you want to talk to me, join my coaching. Nine hours a week. I thought, okay, Banjo's a little world in the UK. I thought when we do slow reps, high intensity training workout, it is time under tension, but it's effort. Yes, slowing the reps down increased the effort generally. And I mean machine because I feel safe to push myself so I don't have a spotter. Yes, that's when a machine would be safer. The reason we do slow repetitions is one, safety, slower repetitions, reduce momentum, reduce excessive force, and force is what causes injury. Two, slowing the repetitions down, reduce momentum, which generally, most of the time, increases effort. Please debunk the latest video with Israel Tell and Menno. Oh, man. See, Leon, why you're skipping my question? I answered it earlier. Go back and watch the video later. I'm not answering it again. I used respond. Da, 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 da. I answered your question earlier. Yes, I did. <laughs> is it really anything after 90 seconds in a set will just increase endurance? No. Will it also shrink my muscles? No. <laughs> no. No. Why would it shrink your muscles? Physiologically, think about that. What would happen that would make your muscles shrink? It's just insane. Um, no, nothing. Things after 90 seconds don't increase endurance. Endurance isn't a general adaptation. Endurance is an activity-specific adaptation, mostly having to do with neurological efficiency. You can't weight train for endurance versus weight train for strength versus weight train for muscle growth. You can't separate the adaptation. They all come together. Endurance is a combination of physical capacity and skill. When I go running, if my muscles are extremely weak and my cardiovascular system sucks and I have no skill at running, 
I'm going to suck at running. But as I run, my muscles adapt, my cardiovascular system adapts, and my skill improves, which makes running easier. Now, if you take a strong body, I don't run often, but if I were to start running, I already have the strong body and the physical capacity. What I'm missing is the, is the skill. So if I start running for a couple of weeks, my nervous system will adapt, my skill will improve, running will become easier in terms of endurance for running. Okay, one more question. Guys, go to goldenerosystem.com if you haven't tried my program. Support my cause so I can keep doing this shit. Andre, would you recommend a number of compounds in isolation exercises per session? No, I would not recommend anything because everyone is different. The amount of exercises people can tolerate per workout varies between individuals, so no, I would not recommend anything. Okay, one more question. One more, one more. If I mostly walk or stand up my whole day, would that affect my gains? No. Your feet might get sore. But there's very little motor unit involvement and effort and demand placed on the muscle from walking or standing. We literally evolved to walk efficiently. We don't use much effort at all walking or energy at all walking. That's why walking is not exercise. We evolved to walk without barely using any energy. Okay. Man, there's so many questions. <laughs> Trying to wrap this up, but I'm seeing like decent questions. Oh, okay, you said that you drink like 10 liters of water a day. Could you extend, expand on the benefits of drinking that much? Well, I just like to stay hydrated. Um, I live in a hot climate where I sweat all the time, so I drink a lot of water. Um, I'm not drinking that much water for any particular secret benefit. I'm drinking that much water because I just... I'm thirsty because I'm sweating a lot. It's not like drinking that much water does anything particularly special. You just gotta, I just, you know, I'm just sipping on water all day. Talking a lot during the day, so my mouth's getting dry. I'm sipping on water. I probably drink, I don't know, eight to ten of these a day, and these are twenty-eight ounces. I don't, know, I don't know how much that is. Okay, Jeff never just created a scientific study. <laughs> okay. Why do you say Menser's demonstrations of exercise form are bad? Well, did you watch the video? Um, so I did a video where I reviewed... Um the heavy duty training uh, the Mike Mencher's form is bad because it's relatively fast, very slow for that time. Um, the, the form is just not good. I mean, I could go over that someday, but it's just it, by today's standards, Mike Mencher's form is pretty gross. Um, back then it was actually pretty good. Can you explain what IGF-1 and myostatin is and if they impact muscle hypertrophy in any way? Yes, IGF-1 is a it, it is a potential driver of muscle growth, a stimulus for the mTOR pathway. Um, myostatin is a um, cytokine that is released by your muscles, therefore it's called a myokine because your muscle produces it, which acts as a limiter of muscle growth. So everybody has myostatin in their body. And what the myostatin does is it stops the muscle growth process from happening beyond a certain point. So as we grow more muscle, um, we generally have more myostatin, I believe, which keeps us from getting too muscular. Because if we're too muscular, 
there there is a huge disadvantage in terms of utility for that muscle in survival. So that's what myostatin is. Um, people are born with different levels of myostatin. Some people are born with genes that severely limit myostatin or, or maybe you know they don't have it at all. If you look at Eddie Hall, the strong man, he's said to be missing myostatin or having a gene that knocks it out. So that's what myostatin is. Can you increase or decrease myostatin? No. No, you cannot. And if somebody finds a way, then people are going to get extremely, extremely muscular. All right. So that's it for me today, guys. Uh, please go to goldenairsystem.com. Try my program. If you want to work with me personally, have me coach you to the best physique you've ever had, click the link in the description, book a call with me, and I will get you there. Okay? Like, subscribe, bell notification, all that bullshit. And I will see you guys soon.